Hi, welcome back to Protein Function in Biochemistry. My name is Kevin Tolkoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in this video, um, we're talking about hemoglobin, but specifically in the next couple of videos, maybe a few, we're going to talk about uh, two different properties of hemoglobin and how different factors affect them. The first topic we're going to talk about is something called the Bohr effect. And then after that, we're going to move into something called the Haldane effect. Now, depending in what context you're watching the video, which class, certain uh, classes require a little bit more detail. So I'm going to try to break the, this uh, topic or these topics up into multiple videos. So that way the videos will also be a little bit shorter and you can kind of pick and choose what's important for your particular class. Right now, I just want to talk about the basics of the Bohr effect. All right. So we know in the blood, because that's where hemoglobin is, it travels in the blood and it carries oxygen. And it doesn't just carry oxygen, it also is able to pick it up from the lungs and then deliver it to tissues. Myoglobin really is not capable of that, and we talked about why that was in another video. But basically with hemoglobin, its design is to be able to pick up oxygen, but not bind it so tightly that it, can, it can't get rid of it. But when it gets to a particular tissue or cell, it has the capacity to release that oxygen, essentially to feed the tissue. All right. And if you need more detail on that, go back to one of the previous videos where we talked about that. Now we know in the blood, there's a buffer system, which we're going to talk about in another video that's called the uh, bicarbonate carbonic acid buffering system. And there's a pH, a certain pH in the blood. The fact that pH is around 7.4, I believe. Okay. But in any case, depending on where you are in the blood, um, if you're near the lungs, if you're near a metabolically active tissue, the pH can actually change a little bit. So this is a little uh, diagram that I like to talk about. And I'm specifically here talking about a low pH. Now, what is pH? It's the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, right? So if we have a low pH, that corresponds to a high concentration of hydrogen ions, or H+. Now another thing we can also talk about is because of an equilibrium that we're going to look at in more detail in the next video, which is right here, um, that's actually the, describing the blood buffering system, a high hydrogen ion concentration also corresponds to a high carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. But in any case, these three conditions, which technically all relate to each other, low pH, high H plus concentration, and high carbon dioxide concentration, all of these things produce or, or they essentially cause a release of oxygen to the tissues. All right? So we'll talk about why that makes sense in a few minutes, but let's talk about what this means physiologically. All right, so notice one thing. If I ever want to abbreviate hemoglobin, I don't want to write that all, but all the time, I usually abbreviate as HB. That's the pretty typical um, abbreviation. HB is hemoglobin. And right here, this is just a simple equation describing the Bohr effect, right? So what I'm talking about here, this is hemoglobin bound to oxygen. Generally, when you want to talk about some molecule bound to hemoglobin, you put HB for hemoglobin and then a dash and then whatever molecule you're talking about. In this case, that's oxygen. So the Bohr effect says that if I have hydrogen ions and hemoglobin bound to oxygen, in fact, we give that a name. This is called oxyhemoglobin. So if you hear oxyhemoglobin, that's hemoglobin bound to oxygen. If you take the hydrogen ions and essentially react it with oxyhemoglobin, in other words, now you have the hydrogen ion bound to hemoglobin, then it causes release of oxygen. So here I have oxygen bound to hemoglobin, but as, I, as soon as I start adding hydrogen ions to the system, I end up getting release of oxygen from the hemoglobin. You could essentially think of it as the hydrogen ions, the protons, are displacing the oxygen. So this equation, number one, describes the Bohr effect, but what it also says is that as the pH decreases, or the hydrogen ion concentration increases, it does favor a release of oxygen. All right. Now, the opposite also is true. All right. If a low pH and a high hydrogen ion concentration cause release of oxygen, on the flip side, if I have a high pH, which will correspond to what? A low concentration of hydrogen ions, 
then that tends to favor binding of, of oxygen, binding of oxygen by hemoglobin. Okay, so there's a graph that's typically shown that describes this relationship of the Bohr effect. Now, this is a great, if you actually type in Bohr effect into Google and you go to images, you're bound to see a bunch of pictures that look like this. So let's break it down. Well, number one, the thing I want to, I want to, um, to, I want to illustrate to you, and I'm going to very quickly do this very roughly, is the shape of a hemoglobin curve, all right, versus a myoglobin curve, all right. So if we were just looking at myoglobin's oxygen binding, so let's say this is myoglobin MB, myoglobin's binding curve looks something like this. Okay, it's a hyperbolic curve. Okay, and of course I didn't do it exactly, but it looks something like this. If you look at hemoglobin's oxygen binding, it actually looks more like this, something like this. This type of uh, curve is not hyperbolic. This is actually something called sigmoidal. Okay, the reason it gets the name sigmoidal is from um, the first letter S, because if you kind of think about this curve, I mean, it's sort of elongated, but it actually looks sort of like an S. Okay, if you think, kind of th think of it flipped on its side, it sort of resembles an S, right? And that's where it gets the name sigmoid. Anytime you have a sigmoidal curve, and we talked about this before, it means that you have some kind of cooperativity. Um, and, and that also, for enzymes, is going to co correspond to allosteric or allosteric enzymes. But let's look at this curve. So you have three sigmoidal curves here, and I did them in different colors. The red one is going to correspond to low pH. The purple one is normal pH, so about 7.4, and if we go above that to a higher pH, that's the blue curve. Now notice all of them, and I tried to do it as best as I could, they're all sigmoidal curves. Okay, but what you see is that as I change the pH, the actual curve shifts. Okay, and that's actually called the Bohr shift, okay, which describes is described by the Bohr effect. On the vertical axis, I have percent hemoglobin saturation with oxygen. If you remember, Hemoglobin, at least one molecule of hemoglobin, has four binding sites for oxygen. Now, depending on the conditions, are all four of those sites, uh, do all of them have oxygen? Do three of them? Do two of them? Does one site have oxygen or do none of them? It's a good question. On the x-axis, I have the oxygen pressure. And oxygen technically in the blood is in the gaseous phase, so we usually don't talk about concentration of oxygen, but if it makes you feel better, you can talk about concentration of oxygen if that makes you feel better. We're saying the pressure of oxygen, it's basically just meaning concentration if that helps you conceptualize it. So let's think about what this means, all right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, let me do this maybe in gray. All right, let's suppose I pick some pressure of oxygen, okay? This may or may not be physiological, but let's say I pick a pressure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start here and just go up on this and, and bisect ultimately all three of those curves, okay? So if I pick a particular pressure of oxygen, whatever number this is, you should notice three things. Number one, okay, when there's a low pH, when there's a low pH, there's a certain percent saturation, right? When there's a normal pH, there's a certain percent saturation. And when there's a high pH, there's a certain percent saturation. So what you should notice is at low pH, if I keep the pressure the same for all of these, at low pH, there's a lower percent saturation of hemoglobin. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's more oxygen release. In other words, if, there, if there's not as much oxygen if there's not as much oxygen um, saturating the hemoglobin, that means the oxygen has been released. So when there's low pH, this means that there's, there's oxygen release is favored. And that makes sense based on what we talked about. Low pH means high hydrogen ion concentration. We look at this equation, if there's more hydrogen ions that tends to favor oxygen release. What does this tell us about high pH? We'll notice at a higher pH at the same pressure of oxygen or same concentration, there's a higher percent saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. So that maybe means, let's say that means oxygen binding, oxygen binding is favored, right? 
and then we can just say a neural pH, it's intermediate. But the trend knowing this is that if we start at a high pH, oxygen binding is favored there, but as I drop the pH, as I drop the pH down and get more and more acidic, oxygen release becomes more and more favored. Now, here's the question, when might that be important? Well, the reason it might be important is, suppose you are a very metabolically active tissue. And one thing you should realize is that highly metabolically active tissues in general produce two main byproducts. Number one, a metabolically active tissue produces hydrogen ions and it also produces carbon dioxide. We know hopefully from some of our other classes, if not this one yet, that carbon dioxide is a waste product of metabolism. So you have a metabolically active tissue producing both of these things. Now, what do metabolically active tissues use a lot of? This is where you kind of have to go back to maybe some of your previous biology classes. If you remember, probably in general biology one at least, or anatomy and physiology, metabolically active tissues use oxygen. Remember the electron transport chain is absolutely dependent on oxygen. But it, in the process of doing metabolism, it produces hydrogen ions and produces carbon dioxide. So let's rationalize this. What did we just say? It turns out that a high hydrogen ion concentration and high carbon dioxide favors release of oxygen to tissues. Well, if I have a metabolically active tissue, it needs more oxygen. Well, that's pretty handy because it's producing hydrogen ions and CO2. So if you have a hemoglobin molecule that's basically flowing through the blood right next to a metabolically active tissue, the tissue is going to release some of these protons and CO2 ultimately, and the hemoglobin is basically going to sense that. We'll talk about how it does that in the next video. And when it senses that, that favors oxygen release, and that tissue needs more oxygen because it's metabolically active. Okay, So one way you could think about these essentially two molecules right here, hydrogen, ions, and CO2, is they're actively, they're, they're essentially sense sensors for hemoglobin. They're, sensors or they're sensor sensory molecules produced by active tissues that signal, I need more energy, I need more food, basically. And so the hemoglobin senses that, and it drops the food off to the metabolically active tissue. It just turns out that that, that food is molecular oxygen, okay? So hopefully this uh, curve that you see and all the things we talked about hope you understand that a little bit and the, maybe the reason why that makes sense. All right. Another example, if you have a high pH, the flip side of that, that might signal more of a, a, a very um, not metabolically active tissue, maybe something that's more quiescent, it's not super metabolically active. Well, if it's not really metabolically active, it won't be producing a lot of hydrogen ions or CO2, so those will be low. And what did we say? In that vicinity, the pH might be a little higher, and their proton concentration might be lower, CO2 will be lower, and that tends to be more on the favor of oxygen binding. It won't give up the oxygen as easily. And that makes sense. I mean, if you're a not metabolically active, you're more of a static cell, you don't need as much oxygen. And there might still be a little bit that um, gets released because this is, after all, an equilibrium. It's not a one-way reaction but there will be less released by non-metabolically active tissues and a lot more released where the tissues are metabolically active, okay? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight on the sort of the theory of the Bohr effect. And in the next video, we're gonna go into more of the uh, molecular biochemistry on how exactly a low pH actually causes oxygen dissociation, okay? And the one thing I want to leave you with, um, because in a couple of videos, or maybe a few from now, we're going to get more into something called the Haldane effect. This is the Bohr effect, and I want to make that perfectly clear. The Bohr effect is directly talking about how does pH, or hydrogen ion concentration, affect oxygen binding and release to hemoglobin. All right? The Haldane effect is very similar and often confused. The Haldane effect doesn't directly have to do with hydrogen ions. The Haldane effect has only to do with the carbon dioxide.
okay? And we will talk about that in the next video and some of the future ones, all right? So hopefully this video helped you get a handle on part of the Bohr effect. Join us in the next video where we go in a little more detail on the Bohr effect, and then we'll go into the Haldane effect after that. My name is Kevin Tolkoff. Make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.